How's it guys? So today we'll be covering managing complexity for neural networks. Uh, it might be worth your while just going through key point lecture three again. Um, just to refresh your minds on why managing complexity is such a crucial component to the learning aspect of machine learning. Um, fortunately, as it turns out, our strategy for managing complexity in the case of neural networks uh, requires little addition to the actual mathematical machinery we've covered up to now. Uh, and also it permits a rather simple means to conduct the validation analysis. Uh, indeed, in many ways, the validation analysis is perhaps much easier to conceptualize than in the case of tree-based models. Um, what I mean by that is that although it's based on the same mathematical principles, its application is a bit more elegant, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, so today's lecture is going to be nice and easy. Uh, we'll break it down into two components. The first component is going to be regularization. The second component is going to be validation, uh, and then we'll conclude with some remarks. Okay, so let's jump in. Okay, so uh, we know how to construct and train neural networks. We start by specifying a neural network architecture and then pass it through a learning algorithm, which attempts to find the configuration of the parameters of the network, which is best for predicting the data. Now, as mentioned in Key Point Lecture 3, it does not suffice to measure how good our model is doing based on the data that it's already seen. Indeed, our task is to determine whether the model has learned or extracted the true underlying pattern in the data, provided there is one. Um, so we break up our data into an ensemble or training data set and then keep an out of sample set called validation set aside uh, to check how well our model predicts on unseen data. Now, we then manage the complexity of our model and then monitor the performance of our model on the validation set to determine an appropriate configuration. Cool. So what does that actually mean in this context, right? So what does complexity mean and how do we actually manage it? So earlier I argued that a neural network can be viewed as a flexible nonlinear basis. And indeed, the class can easily replicate highly nonlinear structures provided we give it enough hidden nodes and perhaps more relevant to the present day discussions, layers. Um, the general idea being that the more nodes and layers you have, um, these will permit greater plasticity for replicating such structures. Now, this does not come without its drawbacks. Um, recall that our learning algorithm will minimize some objective function, which notionally compares how far our predictions are from the responses, okay? Now, it's not difficult to see then that for a network with sufficient nodes and layers, um, it could easily replicate the responses it has seen exactly. Now, in the regression context, the, this could, for example, be interpreted as a model which passes through the observed responses exactly. And again, this is not great from the perspective of learning, since our goal is to extract the pattern, not replicate features which are unique to a particular data set. Right, so how do we fix this? Well, you might be tempted to suggest that we should simply lower the number of nodes and layers in our model, okay? Now, this is not an entirely implausible strategy. Um, that is to say, if we take it to mean that the more nodes and layers you have, the more complex the structures are that your network can create to approximate the underlying pattern in the data, then uh, it stands to reason that decreasing the dimensions of the network would produce simpler, i.e. less complex, structures. And that is true. However, this is not what we do in practice. Okay? The reasons will become more clear in the next section, but for now, let's just think of it in terms of the learning problem in general. Okay. So, we don't know what the underlying structure is in the data, right? Now, presumably, if we've done our homework, we'll have good reason to believe that it's nonlinear. Otherwise, we wouldn't be using something like a neural network. Um, but we don't know how nonlinear or complex the underlying pattern is. So in order for our model to have a reasonable chance of extracting this pattern, provided we have enough data, of course, uh, it should be at least complex enough to replicate that pattern. If we have a mechanism to manage that complexity, we can then trim it down to something which produces plausible hypotheses of what the underlying structure is. On the other hand, uh, if we specified it too simple and the bound on the achievable complexity for our model is below that of the underlying structure, uh, then we'll not be able to generate any plausible hypotheses 
regardless of how well we manage or, or complexity. Um, so the strategy is then to actually a priori create a model which is over-specified, so i.e. one which is probably too complex or flexible. Okay, now back to fixing the problem. So we've made peace with the fact that our model will a priori be over-specified. So it's not looking great for learning since we know we'll in all probability just replicate the data. Okay. Now the way around this is by way of regularization. So to see what this is about, recall that the parameters of our model dictate what predictions it can make. Okay. Um, now, neural networks are clearly over-parameterized systems, meaning that we have enough parameters to easily find a configuration or combination of values for those parameters, uh, which replicate the training observations exactly. So in fact, uh, there will typically be many such configurations, and this is another cruel drawback uh, of this particular model class, um, but we'll cover more on that in honors. Now, as such, uh, these parameters are also relate to the complexity of our models. Okay. Now, suppose instead of allowing our learning algorithm to pick any set of parameters, we assign it a budget for the notional amount it can assign uh, to all of the parameters in the network. So now our learning algorithm will have fewer configurations to choose from in pursuing its goal of minimizing the objective. And consequently, the complexity of the structures it can produce will have decreased. Okay, so this constraint thus acts as a mechanism by which we can lower the complexity of our model by say decreasing the budget. Cool, so now let's look at the specifics of regularization. Uh, for this course, we'll concern ourselves with two particular forms of regularization, uh, both defined in terms of the weight parameters of our network as follows. In the first, uh, we'll tell the learning algorithm that its budget is defined as the sum of the squares of the weight parameters, must be less than a particular threshold. Okay, this is called L2 regularization, referring to the particular norm applied to the weights. In the second, we sum up the absolute values of the weights and impose a threshold. Okay, so this is the so-called L1 regularization. Again, the L1 referring to the relevant norm. Um, now these have different effects on the parameters, but we'll cover that in detail in honors when we get to um, deeper things about the optimization. Okay, now that's simple enough to calculate. Uh, but how do we actually solve a constrained optimization problem then? Okay, so before we actually employed a routine design for unconstrained optimization problems, right? Well, as it turns out, we can define an equivalent unconstrained optimization problem by simply modifying the original objective function. Okay, that is, uh, we add a so-called penalty term where we add the constraint specification, right? So that budget specification we had before, scaled by some positive regularization parameter. Okay. Now, noting that the penalty term grows as the magnitude of the parameters increase, this will impose a trade-off between seeking a minimum in the first term, right? Which is from the original objective and keeping the penalty term small so that it can actually achieve a minimum on the revised objective function. As such, increasing the regularization parameter has the effect of enforcing a stricter constraint, right? Since we are then free to choose a value for the regularization parameter, uh, we can thus control the degree to which the problem is constrained and thereby manage the complexity of the un underlying model by simply using an unconstrained optimizer, okay? Indeed, uh, it should now be clear why we start with an over-specified model. Okay? That is, we start with something for which the achievable complexity probably exceeds that of the true pattern in the data. And then we tone down this complexity to an appropriate level using either the L1 or L2 regularization mechanisms, uh, each of which in turn may be applied by adding a penalty term to the objective, um, scaled up then by the regularization parameter. Okay. All that then remains is to pick an appropriate level of regularization, i.e. an appropriate size for that regularization parameter. Cool, so how do we pick an appropriate level of regularization? Um, as a final recap of our discussion on the bias variance trade-off, uh, 
recall that in order to ensure that our model has learned, uh, we need to strike a balance in the complexity of our model such that it's sufficiently complex to extract the underlying pattern, but not so complex as to simply replicate features in the data. Uh, but then also, if it's too simple, it will not be able to capture features in the data which are necessarily useful for predicting the response. Okay, now, noting that we're operating under the assumption that we don't know what the underlying pattern is, uh, we have to rely on a measure of the performance of our model based on unseen data in order to determine whether such a balance has been achieved and our model has actually learned. And this is the premise behind the validation set. Okay, uh, We split the data into a training and validation set, fit on the training set, and validate on the predicted responses for the validation set. And then we tune our model to best predict on this validation set. Right, when we're satisfied that our model has quote unquote learned, we then dig up the test set and report our findings. Okay, now fortunately, as it turns out, conducting the validation analysis in the case of neural networks is rather simple, if a little repetitive. First, we create a sequence of value for values for the regularization parameter, starting either at zero or something very close to it, and then systematically increase it to some level will specify by the statistician. Now, defining an appropriate range for that parameter may require some, exp um, some experimentation, but uh, ultimately it's up to the statistician to define that. Okay, uh, we then fit a neural network using the training data under the revised objective function, i.e. we modify the objective function in the gradient descent algorithm by adding a penalty term. Okay. The learning algorithm then provides us with a constrained configuration for a particular value of the regularization parameter, okay, um, which we can then use to evaluate the performance of our constrained model in the validation set. Noting that for values of the regularization parameter which are close to zero, uh, the model is essentially unconstrained uh, and assuming that we've overspecified the model to start with, we expect the training performance to be good i.e. on the ensemble data, but the validation performance to be poor. Then, as we continue iterating through the sequence, increasing the regularization parameter, filling ever more constrained specifications, uh, we can expect the training performance to deteriorate, but the validation performance to improve, right, as it moves towards uh, configurations which are more balanced. Now, uh, if we employ a sufficiently punitive constraint, so if we tune that regularization parameter up too far, uh, of course the model will be too simple and not capture features useful for prediction and thus perform poorly, both on the training and validation set. Okay, right, so the net effect is that we have a systematically deteriorating um, training performance over the range of regularization values. But on the validation set, we expect performance to first improve as we move away from an overspecified model, um, then bottom out, and then deteriorate again as the model becomes overconstrained. Now, the point at which a balance is achieved is clearly where the minimum occurs on this trajectory, i.e. the minimum validation error. Okay, And that's where we read off the appropriate level of regularization. Simple as that. Now, as mentioned before, the validation error is still just a statistic, i.e. a function of the data, and then subject to sampling variation. Okay? As such, if we keep in mind that we have a single realization of the data, we need to account for that uncertainty, uh, attach a point to the point estimates, which we use to construct the validation error. Okay? Uh, indeed, this is again where cross-validation comes in. Okay? That is, by creating multiple training and validation runs uh, based on a single data set, uh, at each run calculating the validation error for a range of values of the regularization parameter. Okay, so we're going to repeat this analysis k times if we have doing k fold validation, uh, cross validation. Um, then we note again that we need to find the minimum on the validation curve, okay, but now subject to uh, variation. Okay. Now we can account for this variation or uncertainty by picking a point not quite at the minimum of the curve, which is created from the mean of the point estimates at each run of the algorithm, uh, 
uh, but rather the largest value of the regularization parameter, which corresponds to a simpler model, um, that's within one standard deviation of the minimum on the validation curve. Okay, remember, so there's uncertainty in the validation curve. You want to pick a larger value corresponding to a simpler model, uh, which is within one standard deviation of the minimum value. Okay. Uh, and again, this is commensurate with Occam's razor and the principle of parsimony as it is applied in statistics, where we pick the simplest plausible explanation or configuration of our model uh, as being the most likely to be true uh, amongst a set of configurations for that model. Cool, so we'll wrap up this video with two remarks. The first remark again concerns the number of nodes in a neural network. Okay, so we've made it clear why we start out with an overspecified model i.e. a neural network with probably too many nodes. But I don't mean here that the starting point of the analysis is always to throw as much neural network as you can at the wall and then leave it to the validation analysis to sort everything out. Indeed, there's still a computational cost associated with evaluating and training the neural network. And as you can gather from the aforementioned validation strategy, there's a substantial amount of looping used in order to ensure that learning has occurred. As such, for a vastly overspecified model, you may find that an appropriately constrained specification, uh, but then most of the parameters in that model will either be close to zero or zero, depending on the effect of the regularization. Um, and in consequence, most of the network will be dedicated to doing nothing. But you'll still expend the same amount of time evaluating the network you started out with. Okay. Now, I like to call this pushing around zeros, essentially a pointless calculation repeated for no real benefit. Okay. Now this may seem trivial in the present context where we often deal with simple problems and relatively small data sets, but deploying large networks at scale, there may be significant monetary cost involved right, in evaluating the network. So a good bit of judgment is required on the part of the statistician to ensure that a sensible starting specification is actually used. Okay. Indeed, uh, we can actually use the validation analysis to find the simpler starting configuration. Um, and this is again something we'll cover in honors in detail. Okay, so the second remark relates to the validation analysis. Again, I'd like to stress that the validation analysis is perhaps the most important aspect of the analysis in this context. And it's particularly true in the case of models which are capable of producing highly complex hypotheses for the underlying structures in the data. Okay. Indeed, regardless of what the application is, your analysis should always be accompanied by a validation analysis, front and center. Not the architecture, not the software, not the machinery you used, but the validation analysis. And in the case of neural networks, this is as simple as plotting a validation curve. And if it is computationally feasible, with error estimates around. Cool, so I hope you found that interesting. Uh, that wraps it up for the intro to machine learning section. Uh, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.